Dr. Johnson's lab is tucked away along the side of the link building at Florida Tech. It's made of two large rooms, one moderately cluttered with wetsuits, a fish tank, desks, a refrigerator full of Infana samples, and one more pristinely kept, housing chemicals and finely tuned equipment. About a dozen students work in Dr. Johnson's lab. There's a former football player from Massachusetts, an only child from China, a newlywed from Bangladesh, a Pittsburgh native who loves to fish, and even a PhD student with aspirations to become an astronaut. They have different ages, nationalities, genders, and are each at different stages in their degree programs, but they all have a common focus, the Indian River Lagoon. The Indian River Lagoon is a really important estuary. You know, estuary is where the river, where a river meets the sea or where fresh water meets the sea. The Indian River Lagoon is 156 miles some odd long from Daytona down to West Palm. And so there's a whole bunch of different types of organisms that live there. And in fact, the Indian River Lagoon is one of the most diverse estuaries in North America. So it's got lots and lots of really cool life there. Some people don't know that, you know, in addition to the dolphins and the manatees that are there, that there's starfish out there, that there's seahorses out there. There's all sorts of really cool stuff. Uh, horseshoe crabs, all these things live in the Indian River Lagoon. So it makes it a pretty special place. It's under a lot of stress because of all the people living around it and the development and how runoff and other anthropogenic or human sourced influences are impacting the lagoon. That's stressing those animals that I just mentioned. In some cases, it's really stressing them. And so we'd like to make the lagoon better. One of the major threats to the Indian River Lagoon is muck which is polluted organic sediment that comes from old algal blooms, leaf litter, grass clippings, all these things kind of settling in the bottom of the lagoon and forming this organic black sludge, kind of like black mayonnaise, that nothing can grow in. And this represents a half a century of accumulated organic material in the lagoon. So I, I call that the legacy load. The main problem with muck is it smothers life and releases nutrients that feed harmful algal blooms. Brevard County has started removing this muck from the lagoon through a process known as dredging. There's this desire to pull that polluted sediment out of the lagoon. So we're talking about environmental dredging to restore habitat on the bottom of the lagoon. It's been done in some places, but not really in the, in the Indian River Lagoon. So exactly what environmental dredging needs to look like, we're still trying to, to understand it, how to do it best. To do this, Dr. Johnson's students are up before the sun, preparing for their research. So what we do in my lab is we look at the ecosystem in the water column, the ecosystem on the benthos, which is the bottom of the lagoon, things like seagrasses and in fauna, which are organisms that live down at the bottom or in the mud or sand. We want to know how those animals and plants respond to the changes when we, when we do a, a mitigation technique like dredging. For doing any of these things to try and help the lagoon, What's it actually doing to the populations that live there? Is there a positive response? And does it happen right away? Does it take six months? Does it take a year? We don't know the answers to those questions. So that's one of the things that we're in the business of in my lab, and that is following populations and their responses to restoration techniques that are new and experimental. Dr. Johnson's students set out on pontoon boats each month as part of their effort to study the effects of dredging on certain organisms. They're usually on the water from sunrise to sunset collecting samples. They take measurements of the lagoon's health by counting seagrass and straining tiny life from the sediment at the bottom. Like many others in the lab, Nyan Malik's research often takes him out on and into the lagoon. But Nyan said he's used to being surrounded by water. That's why he's so passionate about studying the Indian River Lagoon. I have an inherent fascination about the ocean because the place where I was born in my country, my country is by the Bangladesh, the place that I was born is a coastal city. So I have always been in touch with oceans, rivers, canals. Nyan's research is focused on how dredging has affected creatures most would barely notice, amphipods living on the lagoon floor. In studies throughout the world, amphipods are used as bioindicators because they're so silent, they can't move much, they have high reproductive rate. These crustaceans can be choked out of their habitat by the thick muck that has accumulated on the lagoon's seabed. They are very sensitive to organic pollution. If the uh, organic content is too high, they just disappear. If dredging is really improving the lagoon's health, the number of amphipods found in the sediment should increase after dredging has taken place. That is one of the indication. Life. And Nyan's findings do, in fact, show an increase in both abundance, the number of individuals per species, and richness the number of species at the sites where dredging has taken place.
So that means that probably the dredging is working. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But because there are a number of factors that drive species abundance, it's too early for Nyon to say whether dredging is the sole cause of these increases. My analysis is going on, so it, it won't be wise to say something conclusively. But the data that I have been analyzing for like past two years, it shows that some species, some embryotic species are showing up, which can be a good sign. So I'm hopeful Nyan also said further research is needed to determine whether dredging has a positive impact on other organisms, not just amphipods. That's where Danny Jeswick comes in. Danny is a Pittsburgh girl, born and raised. She loves bonefish and tarpon and fishing in the lagoon. Got a little canoe, so go in with that and fish, sight fish usually. She's a first-year master's student at Florida Tech who is just beginning her research work. Danny is taking a new look at the dredging project by comparing Nyan's data to data collected by another Florida Tech lab that focuses on fish. I'm in Dr. Johnson's lab. In um, our lab, we look at benthic infauna, um, and that's what we sample for and collect for. And then Dr. Shanker's lab is also working on the dredging project with us, but he's looking at the fish stuff because he's a fish guy. Danny wants to see if and how Nyan's findings compare to fish populations in the lagoon to determine whether dredging is having a positive impact on larger organisms. She's looking for comparisons, because many of the fish that Dr. Schenker's lab researches feed on the infauna that Dr. Johnson's lab collects. Um, like polychaetes, amphipods, um, larvae, crustacean, um, crustaceans. What exactly are polychaetes and amphipods? Polychaete is a group of annelids, which is just like worms that live in the sediment. And then amphipods are these cool little crustacean things. Um, they're segmented, like they look like an insect is the closest thing that I can um, explain them as. And they also live in and on top of the sediment. They're more mobile because they have little appendages. And it's a new aspect. No one's done this um, aspect to this project yet. Danny works weekends as a server at Bonefish Willie's a restaurant in the lagoon, to help pay for school. And her typical day during the week varies. I'd say the most rewarding thing is just being able to be out in the field and on the river and feeling like I'm actually going to help the river in some way, I'm hoping. Just being able to get out there and get your hands dirty, I guess, and just feel like you're impacting the ecosystem. At the end of the day, Danny said it's all worth it. While Danny and Nyon are studying dredging and its effects on different organisms in the lagoon, Zhao Ma, a PhD student in Dr. Johnson's lab, is researching an alternative to dredging, aeration. The hope is that this experimental technique of adding tiny bubbles to the water will provide another way to reduce muck in the lagoon. Zhao is researching the effects of aeration on benthic infauna and phytoplankton, or microalgae. The research is being conducted on a small residential canal in Satellite Beach. Nobody has done this before. That's very, you know, attractive, you know, because you, you're going to see different things every day. So far, Zhao's research doesn't look as helpful as Nyon's research on dredging. Maybe it's too early to tell because um, we didn't see like a significant change. But there are still six months left in the study, and Zhao has made other important findings about the lagoon. Zhao found that copepods, a group of small crustaceans, have lower feeding rates on bloom-forming species, which can help explain why some algal blooms have gone wild in the lagoon. This could be one of the reasons that why those bloom-forming species can, can bloom, right? Because they're less like predators, less grazers on them. Zhao said some of the problems the Indian River Lagoon is facing are made worse by the fact that Florida is so flat. We don't have mountains, we don't have slope. So the lagoon looks like a, a lake, right? So the water exchange is very limited. That's why it's easy to be polluted. But there are ways for everyone to help the lagoon. For starters. Don't put extra stuff in the lagoon because it's already highly polluted. And I know some people, you know, mowing their lawn and blow the grass into the lagoon. That's really, really bad, actually. If you put a lot of nutrients there, they're going to be settled in the, on the bottom and become muck and then releasing nutrients all the time, you know. But people don't think, think of that because they feel like, okay, that's, 
it's just grass, but it's actually very bad. Another way to help the lagoon is to get involved with an organization like the Marine Resources Council, which is working to protect and restore the estuary through seminars, fundraisers, and volunteer opportunities. The Brevard Zoo and the Indian River Lagoon Research Institute at Florida Tech are also seeking community members to participate in lagoon-related projects. One effort, known as the Living Dock Project, allows volunteers to help restore the lagoon by creating oyster mats, habitats for filter-feeding animals. It will take a community to save the lagoon, from policymakers and leaders to business owners and individuals, but there is hope. It's easy to get discouraged when it comes to trying to protect the lagoon because the problem is so overwhelming. But I think that if people just get educated and pull together and do their little part, the lagoon is salvageable and that's what we should be striving for.